The Mountain Lion by Gene Stafford. Chapter 4 The big dining room was dim because a hop vine grew over the windows. The foreman, the six hands, Mrs. Brotherman, and her daughter, Winifred, Uncle Claude, and the Fawcett children all sat at one long, narrow table which was covered with mottled red linoleum. In one corner of the room stood a gun cabinet which looked like an upended coffin and showed, in this half-light, the blue glint of a dozen barrels. On the long wall behind Uncle Claude, casting an enormous shadow of itself, was the head of a bighorn. The horns, like white half-moons, curled rakishly away from the stupid and dignified face. It did not look dead, but only despondent, unlike the head of the doe in Mr. Fawcett's den, which Mr. Follinsby had once said looked more embalmed than stuffed. Ralph realized that this was the first dining room he had ever seen in which there was not a still life of fruits or fish, or a rare roast of beef. From this eccentric omission he proceeded to observe other peculiarities. The knives and forks did not match, and the dishes did not all have the same design. The spoons were in a tumbler in the middle of the table. The men ate quickly and efficiently, bending their heads low over their plates and not straightening up even when they spoke. The girl, Winifred, who sat nearest the kitchen door, kept a close vigil on the dishes and took them away the moment she saw that they were empty, and brought them back refilled. The food was strange, and Ralph and Molly ate with mistrust. There was strong, tough meat, which Uncle Claude told them was buckskin. Too tongue-tied to ask what he meant by that, they listened for a clue and finally got it when Mrs. Brotherman made the chance remark that this was the last of the deer. There were string beans cooked until they were almost brown, and there was fried mush with gravy. At either end of the table stood a quart can of strawberry jam, and the men took out tablespoons full of it and ate it with their forks. Globules of cream floated on the top of Ralph's glass of milk, and he could not drink it. Before each plate was a smaller plate, with the dessert, a fried pie which was shaped like a rubber heel. No one took any heed of the newcomers. Perhaps they were as shy of the children as the children were of them. And Ralph and Molly endeavored to be as silent and small as possible, and did not look around save when the talk was general and the speakers were off their guard. Ralph's first impression was that all these men were the same size and shape and color, that they were all large, spare, and red-brown, and this, in general, was true. But as the meal progressed, he saw that one of them was very blonde, that another was handsome, and had auburn hair, that a third had a flattened nose like a prize fighter's. Similarly, their voices had at first seemed indistingu indistinguishable from one another, but in time he heard variations in the timbre and even, slightly, in the accents. The talk was endless, but it seemed to be made up almost altogether of non-sequiturs. The men did not interrupt one another, but they did not listen. Questions were answered, but were usually reshaped to fit a statement that was uppermost in the speaker's mind. At the very beginning of the meal, Uncle Claude ha asked Homer Armitage, the foreman, if he thought it might not be a good idea to put in a strip of electric fence along the pasture where he kept one of his prize bulls. And Homer replied, I never was a man for electric fence. If the current goes off, where are you? Old man Terry put some in once, but I don't know if it was ever worth the money or not. Don't ever remember hearing anything more about it, only just that he put it in. I seen old man Terry today, and he said he seen elk sign half a mile this side Wolf Forks. He said it was as clean as a whistle, and I am to go up there this coming Sunday if the weather's good. Uncle Claude and Homer retired into silence, the one to think of electric fence, the other of his hunting trip. Then one of the hands, who was named Dump, said in the direction of Homer, who was now bowed over his plate, Bernard Toby's got his still up there to Wolf Forks. The man next to him said, I knew Bernard Toby in Glenwood. He was a barber there. I guess he got tired of drinking bay rum. Some people like Toby and some don't, said Dump. One that don't is Agnew Prescott. Those two hate each other like poison and half for a dog's age. Kenyon, said another man, did you hear that Prescott took his bulls out to Denver last night? No, I never heard that, said Uncle Claude. 
I ain't taking any of mine till fall. I'm studying on whether I ought to sell advance anxiety. Homer exclaimed with surprise and alarm. Why, you must be touched. Why, my God, he's the best bull you ever had on this place. Uncle Claude said, you may be right. I reckon I won't sell him. I wonder if it wouldn't be kind of a good idea to put up a strip of electric fence around that pasture where I got him. They had all been to a horse sale that afternoon, but each man made a different report. None of them had seen the same people or the same horses, and none had heard the same bids, so that it sounded as if, as if there had been eight different auctions in eight different places, and yet each knew what the other were talking about. Homer, who had not known that the blue-eyed stallion had been sold to a dude for $7,000, though from Uncle Claude's account this must have been the high note of the afternoon, said, You mean that ugly old paint that Bill Prescott sold to Roger Campbell here a while back? You mean that colt that was that little wild mare's, the one B.F. Ward got in Idaho? They all knew the names and the lineage of all the horses in the country, and they spoke of them as if they were people in the way Ralph thought fishermen would speak of boats. They talked of Ruth, the cow pony whose master who had once hitched her up with a team horse when his other team horse had lost a shoe, of Poncho, a dandy little chestnut who had thrown Prescott once when he was three sheets to the wind, of Meadowlark, who was herself an ugly piece of business but had foaled two good colts, the children were tired from the long, halting journey over the mountains from Denver, where they had parted from their tearful mother. The train had not been like any other they had ever been on before. Instead of little rooms with white towels on the backs of the seats and a little shelf by the window where the porter put the glasses of lemonade, there were just rows of bronze green seats which were straight up and down and so hard you felt after a while your bones were going to come right through. The windows were dirty and the car was full of smoke. All the towns they passed through, pausing for a long time while freight was unloaded, were exactly the same. The buildings along the wooden walks had high square facades, and on them, in faded letters, were printed, Livery, Oddfellows Hall, A Sayer's Office. Undernourished dogs meandered about the streets looking for food in the ruts they already knew by heart. There seemed to be no trees in any of the towns, though the great shaggy mountains beyond were densely forested. The train had labored up and up, going right through the mountains, through tunnels too many to count. They spoke very little, but each was conscious of the other's misgivings, and they did not eat any of the Martha Washington candy their mother had bought for them. Once Molly almost cried when they had stopped at a town called Black River, and a man with a bandana around his neck looked right in the window at them, and then turned and spit tobacco juice at a cat. She felt the same surprise and anxiety as she had one morning when she woke up and saw a grasshopper on her pillow looking at her. They were bedazzled by the mountains and the ranch. They had not bargained for anything on so large a scale. It seemed beyond their compassing, and they had already begun to withdraw. Ralph looked at the guns in the cabinet so much bigger than he had imagined them to be from the catalogs, and now while the whole point of coming had been to learn how to ride horseback, he was afraid. For months, he and Molly had planned how they would defy their mother's injunctions. If there's a Shetland pony there, you may ride that if someone is with you, she had said. A Shetland pony, indeed. And how they would disobey Mrs. Brotherman, who, through frequent letters, had promised that she would exercise the most stringent discipline to keep the children away from guns and horses. The moment they had met the sad, mild-mannered housekeeper, they had known that she could easily be shaken from her resolution and this in itself was enough to cloud their passion. Yet, though they no longer felt daring, but on the contrary were afraid, there was no waning of their determination. They knew, both of them, that they would try to escape, would invent headaches, would have nosebleeds, would hide behind books, but they would not, in the end, successfully evade Uncle Claude. They were bound to learn. It was the presence of the genteel Mrs. Brotherman that had finally persuaded Mrs. Fawcett to allow Ralph and Molly to come to the ranch, they had given her no peace after Claude had left and had had tantrums whenever she suggested the alternatives of Puget Sound or Lake Tahoe. And then, when Dr. Haskell said he thought the mountain air might be good for their guitar, she finally wrote to her half-brother, inquiring whether he had any trustworthy women folk in his house who could watch out for the children's baths and clean underwear and health. She put much faith in Mrs. Brotherman because she was from Salem, Massachusetts, and Grandfather Bonnie had been born in Boston. Besides this, Mrs. Brotherman was herself a mother and a widow, and could be expected, therefore, to be more responsible than a spinster or a woman with a husband. 
Ralph and Molly had been prepared to dislike and mutiny against the housekeeper. They saw her as a stout, ill-natured, and red-faced woman with all the power and habits of a school principal. So that this afternoon they had been astonished and almost disappointed to find her a fragile, dispirited gentlewoman who appeared to find everything in the world immeasurably sad and who spoke mostly in the past tense. She did not say, I think you will want to wash before supper, but I thought you would want to wash. She was the widow of a Swedenborgian minister who had come west to die in the sun of tuberculosis. After his death, she had not gone east again because her daughter was said to have a tendency. Winifred was fourteen, a tall and lovely girl who did not look in the least delicate. She was very brown and clear-eyed. She had thick, dark hair, which she wore short, and which lay in tight little curls all over her head. She had her own horse, a Sorel gelding named Noel, since he had been Grandpa Kenyon's Christmas present to her the year she was twelve. Grandpa Kenyon had given her silver mountings for the bridle and a crop made of snakeskin. Winifred was the first of the household they had met. They had stood, begrimed with train smoke, miserable, already homesick, in the shadow of a cottonwood tree while Uncle Claude got their suitcases out of the back of a car. The ride from the station to the barquet had been difficult. Uncle Claude had three times inquired after the health of their mother and sisters. Twice had said he was glad to see them. And this, together with the children's monosyllabic replies, had constituted their conversation. Now, in the shade of the summery tree, they felt doomed to failure, unable to take in the huge snaggletooth mountain ranges that completely encircled the valley where the ranch lay, alarmed by the rapid rushing sound of the river which they could not see, frightened by the steady commotion of animal noises, cows bellowing, horses neighing, dogs barking, birds screaming. They had been glad to fix their attention on one single thing, the girl who came riding her horse across the bridge, which spanned a slough to the west of the house. She dismounted quickly and looped the reins around the hitching post across the lane from where they stood, and when she started forward, Uncle Claude told them about Noel, as if this would establish a bond between her and Ralph and Molly. But the gleaming horse, stamping its delicate foot and flicking his handsome tail, made the presents Grandpa had given them seem paltry and perfunctory. However, Ralph remembered that Grandpa had wanted to bring him a monkey from Australia. So, in a moment, he shook hands with Winifred, noticing as he did so with a shock of pleasure that her blue jeans were stained with dung, and he thought with contempt of Leah and Rachel, who had never got their clothes dirty in their lives. "'I'm mighty pleased to meet you,' she said, and smiled, showing small, even teeth. Ralph and Molly were taken aback by her words and her slow, uninflected speech. They had been taught that the expression she had used was vulgar. You were supposed to say, "'How do you do?' Molly said loudly, "'Who are you?' The girl looked startled, but she smiled again and said, "'I'm Winifred Brotherman. I know who you are.' "'I don't suppose you write poetry, do you?' said Molly. Ralph wished she would stop that kind of talk. She had recited gravel to the conductor just as the train pulled out of Los Angeles, and although he had smiled and said the poem was fine and dandy, it had been perfectly clear that he had not thought much of it. "'Why, no,' said Winifred. "'I reckon I don't.' I've got to go now and get the cows. She mounted and rode off over the river this time. Ralph hoped that Molly and Winifred would be friends so that he could spend all his time with Uncle Claude. And when he had finished his unpacking, he went into her room and said, I think Winifred's peachy, don't you? Molly replied, She has nail brinkley hair, and said no more. Now, watching Winifred, as she moved from the kitchen to the dining room on silent moccasins, Ralph admired her, and, glancing sidelong, he saw that Molly, too, followed her with fascinated eyes. Suddenly, a wave of pity for his sister came over him, and he impulsively touched her hand, which rested in her lap. His pity was focused on her clothes. She wore a flowered, batiste dress with a full skirt, smocked at the waist and at the neck, and the prettiness of it made even more ridiculous her thin, freckled arms, her ugly little face framed by black hair, with which... Mrs. Fawcett often remarked, nothing could be done. Molly, at the touch of his hand, turned and looked him full in the face and smiled wistfully. Ralph met her eyes only for a moment and then looked away, looked at Uncle Claude and saw that he was watching them inquisitively. He read the look as a question of his worth or of his manliness, and abruptly, despite all these lean, red-faced strangers who, now that the meal was over, were thoroughly picking their teeth, he said, Uncle Claude, when are you going to teach me how to ride horseback? 
Mrs. Brotherman, putting her napkin in a bamboo napkin ring, gazed vaguely at the hop vines. His uncle smiled. It was again that winning, bone-enfeebling smile whose memory he had kept since last September. He was as friendly as a child, and he said, "'Is first thing tomorrow morning soon enough?' Then he got up and led the way into the living room, patting Ralph's shoulder as he went by. The others followed him in a single file, all with a slouching gait, as if they would otherwise be unsteady on their high-heeled boots. Ralph longed to join them, but Mrs. Brotherman, in her unhappy way, said she was sure he and Molly were tired and should go to bed at once, and Ralph realized that he was, indeed, so tired that he could hardly bear to think of going up the stairs and getting undressed. Before he went to bed, he had a conference with Molly, who came into his room and sat on a bench, hugging her knees. She had taken off her glasses, and she looked like a black-eyed rabbit. Who ever heard of calling an animal advanced anxiety, she said. I thought of that, too, said Ralph. But what would you do if you were a man and your name was Dump? I would dump it. No, you would have to lump it. They laughed, delighted with one another. Ralph had decided that Molly was not going crazy after all, although there had been a period of a month during the winter when she thought she was going to be kidnapped and had worn a Halloween mask in the school bus every day. She was just different than other people, he supposed. He liked her when they were alone, but she embarrassed him in public because she said such peculiar things. For instance, she said to Mrs. Brotherman this afternoon, Do you have any opinion on the false armistice? And when Mrs. Brotherman said no, she really had not. Molly had said, Oh, of course, you don't live in California, so you wouldn't have seen the Los Angeles Gazette. What she was talking about was the old newspaper they had with one word, Peace, printed in letters four inches high on the front page, but how was Mrs. Brotherman to know? Do you like it here? said Ralph. I don't know. I'll tell you later. I don't like the food, I must say. String beans are the bane of my existence. I like the buckskin. Molly frowned and said nothing for a moment, and then she said, You know, I don't think I'll learn to ride horseback tomorrow. I think I'll wait for a few days, as I have an idea for a short story about an amateur kidnapper. How he regretted his headlong contract with Uncle Claude. He heard a horse snorting in the pasture right under his windows, and his hands turned as cold as ice. Darn you, he said angrily to Molly. Darn you to heck. You always make an up an excuse. He knew he was quite unreasonable. Molly had said nothing about learning to ride, but it seemed so unfair that she could always get out of anything by saying she wanted to write something. All right for you, he said, if you don't come tomorrow. You can't ever come anywhere with me again. My literature is more important to me than you are, Ralph Fawcett, she said coldly, and left the room, pausing in the doorway to make donkey's ears and say hee-haw. For the first weeks of this first visit to Uncle Claude, Ralph and Molly were not happy, and most of the time they were afraid. The landscape itself was frightening. Above Timberline, the snow was thick in the deep gashes. To the north were two long glaciers, which sometimes shone pink through the haze. This pinkness came from the bacteria which inhabited the glacier snow, and when he learned this, Ralph was curiously disgusted, and he did not know why. Below Timberline, and above the dry sagebrush of the foothills, the forests of conifers were dense, their dark blue-green here and there interrupted by a small grove of golden aspens, or a bright upland meadow where Winifred often went to gather columbines. The mountains were at once remote, their summits were often enshrouded by clouds, and oppressively confining. The children had been used to summers at the seashore, and the sea, even in a storm, was something that could be taken in at one glance. Its evils, however, were quite hidden, so that sharks and stingrays, hurricanes and calms, seemed only legendary and needed not be reckoned in their impressions. And even when they went out in a glass-bottomed boat and saw the fish all golden and green and huge looking up at the passengers, they did not feel any of this was real, but was only like a movie. But the mountains wore peril conspicuously on their horny faces. Through Uncle Claude's field glasses they could look directly at the ledge from which a pack horse had slipped and fallen to her dreadful, screaming death. They knew the place where a bold dude had frozen in midsummer, having lost his way in a cloud when he was scaling an arete. The foothills were alive with rattlesnakes. At dawn the coyotes wakened them, and through the windows they could see the small, shadowy sneak thieves on the rim of the hill to the south of the house. The howling had a cold and beggarly sound, sometimes intolerably like an outraged human voice. The house, spacious and rambling, made of white brick, faced north upon the fast stream, 
called the Caribou River, which cut the pasture land in half. On its banks grew cottonwoods and weeping willow trees, and dense amongst them choke cherry and sarvis berry bushes. Here beavers made their clever dams, and here hoot owls warned at night. There was no place that was not alive with something. A bridge led to the pasture on the other side of the river where the milk cows grazed, and where there were cattails five feet high, and where often the children saw blue herons. To the west was a broad, treeless field of Timothy, bound on one side by the slough that ran along the red road. Its west fence was parallel to the railroad track, where the slow, mixed train went past in the early evening, ringing its lonesome bell. The foothills leading to the summer range were to the south, and the view of them was cut off through the lower windows of the house by a line of eight Lombardy poplars. Between the house and the road was the pasture and the barn and the many sheds laid to the east. Everything and all the people, with the exception of Mrs. Brotherman, made Ralph think of Grandpa, and he had the feeling that the old man's other ranches, which now Uncle Claude would visit once a year in September, were similar, save that this was the only one in the mountains. The men were skillful, good-humored, hard, living within the present time and on a large scale. When they got drunk on a Saturday night, they did so with abandon, behaving exactly as drunk people in the movies did. Their lawlessness seemed natural. It seemed altogether reasonable that they hunted at all times except during the open season, when, as Uncle Claude said, there was too much danger of getting shot at by them dudes from Denver. The revenue officers and the game wardens intimidated no one. Strangers to the country, they could not police all the hundreds of hiding places for stills in the mountains, nor could they catch the poachers who wanted wild meat and proposed to have it. Ralph thought of the house in Covina, with all its flurry of little objects, little vases and boxes on little gilt tables and whatnots hanging in the corners, and then thought of the big, bare rooms of the ranch, where the furniture was heavy and solid as if it were nailed to the floor, and the only small things were catalogs from L.L. Bean and Montgomery Ward, boxes of buckshot, flybooks, odd bits of leather and metal which had no use, but which remained undisturbed week after week, on the mantelpiece and the tables. He thought of the delicate food they had at home, and then the sage hen and puff balls and head cheese they had here, and Ralph felt that when Grandpa left them he must have always gone away hungry. But the most amazing contrast of all was between Fuchsia and Magdalene. Fuchsia was young and pretty and good-natured, but full of respect, so that she called them Miss Molly and Mr. Ralph. But Magdalene, she was the first Negro besides Pullman Porters they had ever seen up close. Molly was so frightened when the old woman took her hand in her skinny black one with its pink palm like a monkey's that she wanted to go home at once. Magdalene seemed hundreds of years old, so old that if she lived another century or two, she would not look any different. Her skin was not yellowish to show that she had white blood. It was rather as if it had faded to a bluish gray. Her lips were purple, and they had so many lines that they looked like narrow grass grain ribbons. Her brown eyes were as mean and watchful as a chipmunk's and the scraggly fuzz on her little head looked like dirty snow. She was not in the least kind. She was always smoldering with an inward rage or a vile amusement over something sexual or something unfortunate, and she spoke chiefly in obscene or blasphemous expletives. But she was wonderfully wise. She knew when it was going to rain and when someone was going to get sick and when a cow was going to get through a fence. Her wisdom was something antediluvian and cosmic, and the almanac she went by dated back a million years before the fall of man. She was, Molly thought, the wife of the scalawag at the wash. She had her own little cabin between the barn and the bunkhouse, and she raised white rabbits in a hutch beside it. No one ever saw the interior of it, but the children imagined that it must smell frightful, for not only were the rabbits so near, but she cooked strange things on her stove, things like beaver tails and the lungs and testicles of freshly butchered calves. Up on a hillside, a mile behind the barn, Magdalene kept some goats of her own, milking them every morning before sunrise, and again in the evening while the others were finishing their supper. One afternoon, Ralph met her coming around the corner of the corral, carrying a dead and bleeding goat slung over her shoulder. In her free hand, she carried a small hatchet, bright with thick neck blood. Ralph asked her why she had killed her goat, and she replied, I was hungry, that's why, you little old June bug. So I went out and botched him on the head. Uncle Claude could not remember where Grandpa Canyon had found her, and she would never tell the children where she had lived before. When once they asked her where she had been raised, she said, I wasn't raised. A cowbird laid me in the sagebrush, and the sun hatched me out. <laughs>
They did know that she had two sons named Salem and Jordan and a daughter named Salmetta. Once Jordan sent her a bottle of Ben-Hur perfume, and while she laughed like a lunatic with contempt, she poured it all over herself and the kitchen reeked. It smelled like the cheap chocolates with pink fillings they got in Covina, four for a penny. Magdalene's territory was the kitchen, and she never went into the other part of the house, for besides bringing the food to the table, Winifred made the beds and did the cleaning. Magdalene did not like to have anyone fussing in her kitchen. She did not mind the men hanging up their chaps there, or even having a cup of coffee in the middle of the morning if they were working around near the house. And she suffered Ralph and Molly to poke into the cupboards and watch her make pies, so long as they did not ask for anything to eat. Although occasionally she would give them bits of raw potato, always with the remark, knew a horse died of them. But she would not stand for Mrs. Brotherman, whom she called Ms. Bobo, or Ms. Budmanny, or Winifred to hover over her, and if, in the morning, she discovered that after she had gone to her cabin for the night, someone had made fudge with her sugar in her pan on her stove, she swore a blue streak half the day through. Molly got the idea that she looked like Magdalene, and for some time thought that she was probably her daughter. She had never been at all certain about the circumstances of her infancy, for Leah had told her that for the first years of her life, she had been only the size of a talcum powder can, and they had kept her on the mantle beside grandfather Bonnie's ashes. This was, of course, a big fat lie, but all the same, there were some peculiar things about those early years. For example, she clearly remembered riding an elephant, and the more she looked at her, the more certain she became that Magdalene had been the driver. But she did not ask her about it, because Negroes were essentially the same as Mexicans, and if you did not keep your distance from them, there would be the Dickens to pay. But she watched her and listened to her, and in her diary she referred to her as... Mrs. Scalawag. The one part of the ranch that was anything like home was Mrs. Brotherman's sitting room, directly above the parlor. Mrs. Brotherman and her room always smelled of apples, giving the children a feeling of perennial Halloween. Everywhere, there were small baskets and bowls on the tables and hanging shelves, full of Macintoshes and wine saps and of golden grimes. As vivid as the smell almost was the sense of oldness in the room, coming from the furniture and the oddments, and coming as well from Mrs. Brotherman's Boston accent and her strange syntax. Close as they lived to the Brothermans, the Fawcett's rooms were across the hall. They were invited so seldom into the sitting room that it always held an air of foreignness for them, and because they never got so used to it that they could take it for granted, the fruity fragrance always surprised them. So also did the coolness in the furniture which set upon a dim cabbage-rose carpet between walls on whose yellow paper were tidy rows of dark green laurel wreaths which cast oblique and questionable shadows. In the center of the room there was a large round table with a single stout leg. It was covered with blue velours and the four corners hung straight to the floor weighted and decorated with wiry gold tassels. On the table was an armadillo sewing basket which Ralph found so revolting that if Mrs. Brotherman asked him to fetch her scissors from it, he shuddered. There was a music box on the table which played first, Oh Mistress Mine, and then, Why Does Azure Deck the Sky? There was a bust of Socrates on a shelf and a picture of George Washington over the fireplace. There were two wing chairs covered in shints with tatted antimacassars on the arms and the backs, and there was a terrarium with a peaked roof in which grew brake fern, partridge berry, and wintergreen. She had a silver candle snuffer and a glazed bowl holding aromatic pine cones, a Van Briggle vase of Everlastings, and a souvenir sofa pillow from the Garden of the Gods. There was nothing chipped or marred or stained or dusty. Only time had altered the looks of things by draining away the colors, as it had drained them away from Mrs. Brotherman's cheeks and hair and eyes. She was a secretive, almost as Magdalene about her past life, but once, in a thin burst of expansiveness, she told them that before Winifred was born, she and Mr. Brotherman had gone to Manitou Springs for two weeks, and she showed them a photograph of herself and her husband sitting on a rock, holding up two folding cups of mineral water. In the background was a cement pop bottle ten feet high. They both looked bleakly into the eyes of the camera. The children could tell by the looks of the narrow-faced and wasted man that he had been as sad as his wife. They concluded that she had been born that way, and it was not her widowhood alone that had cast her into eternal twilight. They often spent hours with her, helping her weed her flower garden, which was famous for its roses. She dry dried the petals for potpourri and gave them to the ladies who sometimes came to call in the hot afternoons to visit with her in her sitting room and drink iced tea and eat ginger snaps.
They liked Winifred more and more, although at the very beginning they had been in doubt about her because she had taken them swimming in the pool behind the barn and had said she was going without her suit. But she didn't, of course, and after a while they realized she had only been teasing. They started a detective agency and found clues all through the foothills. They believed that Dump was running a gambling den in a gulch, and they collected a great deal of evidence against him. But he outsmarted them all summer long. Ralph could not make up his mind about Uncle Claude. One thing was certain, he was not as nice as Grandpa. He laughed unkindly at their blunders and told about them at the table. Once poor Molly asked who milked all the cows up on the range, and he laughed so hard he made her cry. Mrs. Brotherman explained to her that this was a breeding ranch, not a dairy farm, but she was unconsoled and hated Uncle Claude for three days. And still, he would occasionally give Ralph a friendly push or invite him to ride along with him and to pick up the town, and when he did this he smiled with the same sort of generosity in his mobile face as Grandpa used to. The trips to town, though, were never a success. The sun was always so glaring on the asphalt that Uncle Claude, Uncle Claude was too preoccupied with his driving to talk. So Ralph stared at the fields where the white-faced Herefords grazed and at the dreary, unpainted farmhouses that stood here and there along the road, unprotected by any tree, bleak and dusty in a grassless field. Then, on the way back, Uncle Claude was wrapped up in remembering what news he had heard in town and the purchases he had made, and while he was talkative enough then, Ralph was not really interested in learning that Bernard Toby's horse had the Sweeney, or that Shorty Peterson had hired a Mormon kid who had been baptized 125 times, or that Roger Campbell, always as independent as a hog on ice, had refused to give back Claude's hackamore, maintaining that possession was nine-tenths of the law. There were times when it seemed to Ralph that Uncle Claude was somehow trying to get even with his mother. Every time he took them riding, he would say, laughing as he got into the saddle, I reckon your mother would have a set of dishes if she could see you now. It both thrilled and frightened them to think what she would really do, probably send them to the penitentiary. He and Molly rode only the oldest and safest horses, but something always went wrong. Uncle Claude told them that a horse had a sixth sense, which could judge whether his rider was afraid, and would, out of pure orneriness and show off, play tricks on him if he were. So that the old white horse eye opener, whom Molly rode, would pretend that he was half blind and would deliberately stumble into gopher holes so she that so that she pitched forward, clinging desperately to the pommel with a flushed face and wide staring eyes. And Studebaker, the black Ralph rode, refused to wade into the streams. Give him your spurs, Uncle Claude would cry, and Ralph would tentatively push his heels into the horse's flanks. Harder, give him something to think about so that Ralph would dig harder, driven by shame, mortally afraid of being thrown into the water. Then Studebaker, snorting, would fling back his head and rear so that Ralph had to rivet himself to the saddle to keep from falling. But he did not, like Molly, grasp the horn, for Winifred had told him that was something only dudes did. Although more and more often he enjoyed the rides, through the ripe meadows and along the red roads, beside the river where the Sarvis berry brushed its cinnamon-smelling flowers against his face, and into the cow pasture as the sun was setting, Ralph did not outgrow his uneasiness at being so high off the ground and being dependent on so capricious an intelligence as that which lay in the long black head. And when he began to saddle his horse himself, it was hard to keep back the tears when he put the bit in Studebaker's enormous mouth with its enormous square teeth and yellow-green tongue. Uncle Claude occasionally praised him and his confidence grew, but he was so mean to Molly he sat on that bench like a sack of potatoes, he would say to her, that she seldom went with them, but stayed at home to help in the garden or to write. She was now writing an article for Good Housekeeping called My Summer at the Bar Cay. In the latter days of June, a series of tragic accidents took place, following one another as if by a spiteful plan. A horse, frightened by the backfiring of a car, stumbled and fell on the rain-slick highway, breaking his leg and crushing the foot of his rider, Homer Armitage. Nauseated with pain, Armitage roused himself enough to shoot the horse, and then they lay half an hour in the road until a passing motorist found him. The men at the bar cay carried the dead horse in a truck up to the place where the coyotes gathered most often after they had robbed the hen house, and they poisoned the meat with cyanide. Later, a magpie brought a chunk of meat down into the yard where Uncle Claude's favorite dog, a beagle, found it, ate it, and died in convulsions. Ralph never forgot his uncle's rage when Magdalene brought him the news at dinner. He got up and at once went to the gun cabinet and then strode through the kitchen. Dump said, I reckon he'll pick off a magpie. A man can't blame him. 
Everyone was silent, waiting for the shot. There was only one report from the 22, but Uncle Claude did not come back to his dinner, and someone said he had probably gone to bury the dog. When the meal was over, Ralph went out into the yard, and there beside the milk house he saw nine pag magpies standing in a circle round a tenth, which was dead. They were scolding in unison, their harsh, hawk-like voices clawing at the noontime quiet. Their impeccable feathers, coal black and snow white, gave them the look of professional mourners, formally attired. Ralph approached, but they did not fly away. Instead, two turned and faced him, shrieking abuse and hopping with anger. The racket continued until one of the men came out of the house and tramped through their circle to pick up the dead bird and fling it with disgust into the slough, crying back to the others, Shut up, you goddamn buzzards. They left the ground then, but for a long while afterwards sat in a neat row on the fence, remembering from time to time to mourn raucously. Uncle Claude was mending fence today, Ralph knew, and after a decent time had elapsed, he got on Studebaker and set out for the farthest pasture up behind the barn. He had hesitated as he mounted, partly because he had never ridden so far alone before, partly because he was not sure that he should intrude upon his uncle's sorrow, just as he had not been sure after Grandpa's funeral. But he thought that since the circumstances were so similar, they might again reach the same kind of amiable understanding they had done the other time. It was hot in the sun, and he had forgotten to bring his hat. The glare on the meadows was as blinding as if it shone on tin. There was a violet heat haze hiding the tops of the mountains toward which he rode. He was stupefied by the silence and by his solitude and by the even trotting of his horse, who, today, behaved himself and even forded the river at the shallows with hardly any persuasion, though Ralph, for an unseen audience, gave him his spurs, felt the rowels spin lightly against the tough flesh. Only once was he afraid, for it occurred to him that Uncle Claude might have finished the fence this morning and was mending somewhere else. The possibility of not fulfilling his mission made him uneasily self-conscious. He would feel like a sap when people asked him at dinner where he'd been, and he would have to say, Oh, I just went for a ride, for no one here did anything without an end in view. He ascended a ridge, and then across a wide field of alfalfa he saw Falcon, his uncle's horse, cropping peaceably near the fence. Falcon, a young Palomino, and the handsomest horse on the place, was sought after by all the other horses, but he had singled out Studebaker as his particular friend, and in the early evening, as soon as they were unsaddled, they trotted up the lane together and then went running up the road to disappear into the foothills. When they were pastured with other horses, they were standoffish, and if one of them came too near, Studebaker would rear up and kick the air with his hind legs. Studebaker catching sight of Falcon neighed, his whole body shuddering with vibrations, and then, though Ralph tightened the lines, he broke into a lope and then into a run. Ralph was claimed by the wildest terror he had ever known. The hot wind stung his cheeks and ears and his feet, flexing in the stirrups. His knees hugging the horse ached so intolerably he could have screamed with pain. Blinded by the speed and by the sun, he could not see his uncle, but he did see Falcon, huge, blonde, his creamy mane waving, come running toward them, whinnying passionately. In his quick agony, Ralph scanned the film in vain and screamed his uncle's name. Instantly, from some place he could not determine, his uncle shouted, Falcon! And the Palomino slowed down with a final disappointed whinny. But Studebaker paid no heed and raced on. Then Uncle Claude, appearing suddenly from nowhere, came running bareheaded across the field, hollering words Ralph could not understand. And when he was fifty feet from them, Studebaker changed his gait to a gallop but swerved suddenly to avoid the man, and in doing so reared, not high, but so abruptly and surprisingly that Ralph's feet flew out of the stirrups. His sweaty hands turned loose the lines, and he went crashing down into the sweet, gentle clover, his glasses falling off to lie unharmed beside his nose. He closed his eyes and listened to the hooves retreating and the lunatic neighs saluting and responding, listened to his uncle reproaching him on running feet. You damned little numbskull, are you hurt? He did not know whether he was hurt, and he did not care now that he was safe on the ground, but the annoyance in Uncle Claude's voice wounded him. Uncle Claude knelt down beside him and Ralph opened his eyes. The sunburned, sharp-boned face was, when Ralph first looked at it, so stern that he thought, now he will send me back to Covina. But then the look gave way to that rare smile, and Uncle Claude said, you better see if you're hurt. You can't, can't trust that fool bench when he's around my horse. Ralph set up cautiously and pulled up his Levi's. His legs were not hurt, except for a big bruise on his left knee. His elbow was skinned, and there was a bump on his left temple, but these were his only injuries. He was giddy, though, 
and the meadow swam like fishes under the high sun. Then he realized that his glasses had fallen off, and he groped for them with both hands as if he could not see at all. Uncle Claude found them for him and handing them over said, What's the matter with your eyes that you have to wear those things? I don't know. I've always had worn them since I had scarlet fever. The nosebleeds come from that too. Will you always have to wear them? There was a curious eagerness in his voice. This was the first really personal question he had ever asked Ralph. He replied, I don't know. Dr. Haskell never said. Both he and Molly had grown so used to their glasses that they did not even mind particularly being called four eyes by other children. Indeed, there were times when they took pleasure in their weakness, which distinguished them from others, and which served as well as an excuse for not playing baseball or pom-pom pull away, at which, before Scarlet Fever, they had been so poor that they were the last to be chosen on a team. "'Well, you look a whole hell of a lot better without them,' said Uncle Claude. "'Thank you,' said Ralph, although he realized it had been what his mother would have called a left-handed compliment. "'What'd you come up here for, anyway?' I came to see if I could help you bury Juanita, he said. Well, that was nice, said Uncle Claude, and Ralph, once more unsure of himself, despite the smile, thought he used the word nice contemptuously. It wasn't much of a job. She was just a little dog. Ken Burkhart threw the magpie you shot into the slough. Did he now, said Uncle Claude, but he was preoccupied. Ralph could not get through. He remembered a time when he and Grandpa were in the grove one Sunday morning. For some reason, he had not had to go to Sunday school, and he was exuberant with the holiday feeling. But he could not make Grandpa talk to him. He asked for a story, but the old man refused. Not crossly, but distractedly. Ralph had felt compelled to force him to talk, and so he began to ask questions. Was it true that if you swallowed a lemon seed, a lemon tree would grow in your stomach? Did he like post-toasties? Had he ever seen a buffalo, not in a zoo? Did he not think that monkeys looked a lot like people? Did he have very many dreams? At first, Grandpa had answered briefly, but not unkindly. But then suddenly he jabbed the ferrule of a shillelagh in the ground and said sharply, Damn it, lad, can't you see I've got something on my mind? Today he felt that same compulsion, even when he remembered how hot and faint he had been after Grandpa's rebuke. And seeing his uncle light a cigarette and lie down full length in the alfalfa, covering his eyes with his handkerchief, he said, where did you bury her? Yonder, said Uncle Claude, vaguely motioning toward the river, by the shallows. Oh, I must have passed the place. There was a silence. Studebaker and Falcon had calmed down now, and were cropping side by side in the middle of the meadow. It was not really silent, there was a steady undercurrent of the noises of the land, but they were so closely woven together that only a sudden sound, like the short singing of a metal lark, made you realize that everywhere there was a humming and a rustling. And then, the separate sound, the song, or a splashing in the river was like a bright daub on a dun fabric. Ralph said, are you going to get a new dog? Sure, I'll get me a new dog. I'll miss that little old hound, but I'm not a fellow that goes to the mope house over a dog. What, the, what is a mope house, Uncle Claude? It's a place where the niggers go and mope when somebody dies. Uncle Claude grew rather talkative after that. He told Ralph that there were towns in Oklahoma where only Negroes lived, and at the outskirts there were signs saying, White man, get out of this town before sundown. He said Ralph could come along with him this fall when he went to look at Grandpa's ranches. He'd be glad to have the company. I haven't finished school yet, said Ralph. I don't think I'll go past the seventh grade. How far did you go? Eighth. I wouldn't have gone that far if it hadn't been for your mother. Mr. Kenyon used to tell her and tell her that you couldn't make a silk purse out of a sow's ear, but she didn't believe him. I reckon she believes him now, all right, after the way that preacher showed me up that day. I'll tell you something funny, Uncle Claude, about that day. And he told what Molly had said to Mr. Follinsby. Uncle Claude laughed so that his belt buckle hopped up and down on his stomach like a jumping bean. That Molly, he cried, she's a caution. You like her, said Ralph. Sure, I like her. Sometimes she's too many for me, but she's as funny as a crutch. Sometimes I don't think she is on purpose. He sat up, laughed again, and said, Come on, help me mend this outfit. Just as quick as I get one stretch mended, then she busts out in a new place. Beats me. All afternoon, Ralph worked like a grown man, holding the post steady while Uncle Claude nailed on the barbed wire. He was happy at first, but gradually he got cross from the heat. The smell of alfalfa became cloying. A dozen times he asked his uncle what time it was. He was depressed at the thought of having to mount that crazy Studebaker again. Uncle Claude had said when they were working on the first post, a fall like that one don't amount to anything, but the first time it happens to you, you feel kind of worried. 
Ralph had replied, oh, I wasn't scared. He wanted the time to pass quickly so that he would be safe at home again, but when he thought of the moment of getting into the saddle, he trembled all over and wished the sun would never set. But when the time came, he was not afraid. Claude had something of a time-catching falcon who took it into his head to run around in circles like a trick horse, but he was outwitted at last, and Uncle Claude led him to where the Studebaker stood, for once oblivious of his friend. They were almost like people who were temporarily not on speaking terms. Ralph mounted and realized intuitively that he was in complete control of his horse. He spurred him at the river, and Studebaker leaped forward at the pricking. And then, when he had crossed the water, resumed a steady gait. Uncle Claude pointed out the place where he had buried Juanita and said, I don't know why I wasted a bullet on a magpie. A dead magpie ain't going to bring back my dog. He said he would bring Ralph up here at dusk one day and see if they could catch, catch that beaver that was damming up the west slough that ran off from the river at a right angle. He went on then to talk of hunting trips he had made and hunting trips he would like to make. This year he would miss his expedition to the Bears Ears because he would have to make the rounds of the ranches. At the Bears Ears he hunted elk and deer, and it was there that he had got the bighorn whose head hung in the dining room. Two things he had never seen were bears and mountain lions. To be sure, they weren't anything a man would want to eat, but he'd like to see them anyhow. About fifteen years ago, before Uncle Claude came here, there had been a raft of mountain lions in this country, but they seemed to be all gone now. At least no one he knew had ever seen one. What do they look like, said Ralph. How should I know? I just got through saying i never seen one. Well, I'd like to see one. He wished he would be hiking by himself in the mountains one day, and suddenly come on a lion's den. He would shoot the mother and the cubs, and then take Uncle Claude up to sea. He could just hear Uncle Claude suck in his breath and say, Well, I'll be a son of a gun. <laughs>